Towards a Spiritualized Society, Oroville, an Experiment in Prefigurative Utopianism. Doctoral Thesis by Suryamai Ashvini, Clarence Smith. Chapter 7 Oroville's Communal Economy Ideals, Realities, and Devolution. Quote, it is questions of the proper organization and administration of the economic life of the society which are preparing the revolutions of the future. Sri Aurobindo It was clear from the inception of Oroville that its economic organization would be critical for prefiguring a spiritualized society. This grounding of a utopian project in the material conditions of life is characteristic of what Marxist utopian scholars define as real or concrete utopias. To this day, the topic of how to prefigure such an Orville economy, as Orvillians refer to it, is alive, a source of both aspiration and frustration wrought with challenges. This chapter traces the emergence and evolution of Oroville's communal economic framework, institutions and policies, and how the community's founding economic ideals have and continue to galvanize, underpin and inform these. In so doing, it necessarily explores the ongoing challenge of competing visions and approaches to economic administration in Oroville and both legal and financial challenges for fulfilling its economic ideals, reflecting the reflexively critical nature of prefigurative utopian practice in Oroville. The first section of this chapter explores the roots of Oroville's economic organization in that of the Sri Aurobindo Ashram and the founding economic ideals for Oroville drawing parallels with Marxist economic ideology. The second investigates the early history of Orville's economic organization and highlights the critical departure from this first form as the community dissociated from the Sri Aurobindo ashram. The third section considers the erosional effect of recently introduced economic policies on the communal character in administration of Oroville's central fund, whose reflexive response to deploying these I theorize as subjectively objective, pertinent in the context of increased bureaucratization in Oroville. In the fourth, I appraise the design and administration of Oroville's member stipends as an attempt to balance individual and collective forms of provisioning in light of the community's socio-economic ideals. Empirically, this chapter contributes a significant case study of alternative and prefigurative economic organization, particularly relevant for practices of participatory budgeting and non-monetary forms of provision, universal basic services and basic income policy programs. In capturing the historical development of our communal economic administration, it also consists of an important piece of community research for Aurovillians. Those who were not early community members are overwhelmingly unfamiliar with this history, and many are critical of our present economic setup, with little awareness of the challenges faced in establishing the stage of prefiguration we have arrived at today. The historical aspect of this work thus promises to increase understanding of these, while the autoethnographic mode I employ, which reveals the ongoing efforts and trials faced by fellow community members in attempting to embed our ideals into practice, has been known to achieve increased sensitivity and understanding within groups. I hope this will be an outcome of this research. Sri Aurobindo Ashram the prototype for Orville's economic organization. 
Orville did not start with a blank slate in terms of its economic imaginary. The mother had already created a unique economic unit out of the Sri Aurobindo ashram in Pondicherry, in which she prefigured a model for economic organization congruent with the ideals of spiritualized society of integral yoga, as well as spiritualized approaches to economic activity. This experience formed the basis of her economic vision for Orville and was instrumental in the formulation of the Orville economy, continuing to inform its development to this day. Unlike other ashrams in which members primarily engage in meditation, devotional practices, the study of sacred scripture, or acts of charitable service, and which rely almost exclusively on donations for their subsistence, under the mother's direction, members of the Sri Aurobindo ashram developed and managed numerous enterprises as departments of the ashram. These include wood and steel workshops, the Harpagon workshop, handmade paper and incense factories, the handmade paper factory, or Oshika, an interior design and furniture firm, or Form and or Fern, a printing press, an Ayurvedic clinic, and a cosmetics laboratory and shop, Laboratoire Centeur and Florent Flacon. Most were founded in Pondicherry in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s, and are still in operation today, recognizable throughout the city by their ashram grey wall exteriors, and the display of the mother and Sri Aurobindo symbols in the signage, as well as photographs in the interiors, although the latter are also used by non-ashramite shop owners who are nonetheless devotees. They were founded based on the skills and interests of ashramites whose pursuit the mother encouraged as a form of karma yoga, of work according to one's nature and as an offering to the divine. Income generated from these enterprises sustains the ashram and its members, each of whom work in one of the ashram's departments, which also include free services for ashramites and ashram life. Ashramites working in any department, whether a service or a business, do not derive a direct monetary income from their work, but are housed, fed and cared for by the ashram, receiving a monthly bundle of basic commodities – clothing, toiletries, pocket money – called prosperity, and can engage in any of the numerous complementary educational, artistic, cultural and sportive activities organized by the ashram. Concrete Utopia, the prefigurative rationale for Orville's economy. The economic organization of the ashram is a seed form of the one that the mother seemed to envisage for Orville. Clearly, she considered that a new form of economic organization was necessary to facilitate the spiritual and material emancipation of individuals and relationships of solidarity between them in order to create a conscious, harmonious society. The mother never comprehensively defined how Oroville should function. Its premise was to be a spiritually prefigurative experiment in conscious evolution, and forms of collective organization would emerge out of this process and continue to develop alongside it. They could not be anticipated and should not be prescribed on the contrary, space for them to manifest unfettered should be safeguarded. For this reason, the mother insisted on there being no fixed rules in Oroville and that its organization, quote, must be flexible and progressive. Interestingly, while Marx offered an insightful critique of capitalism, he did not detail how a communist system would function by virtue of the same reasoning that the mother did not for Orville. One could not anticipate how a society with a heightened level of collective consciousness, the communist project, or a heightened collective level of consciousness, the Orville project, would choose to do so. The point was not to predetermine and prescribe 
how a future society of emancipated individuals would organize, but for it to develop in tandem with its members. This is consistent with the Marxist utopian philosopher Ernst Bloch's insistence that utopian does not describe a perfect and fixed state, but a dynamic function, whose role it is to reach into the novum, the entirely new, informed by a potentiality latent in the present. His redefinition enables us to recognize an alternative utopian rationale in the refusal to prescribe new societies, one that stands in direct contrast to the blueprint approach of the utopian social theorists that were Marx's contemporaries and other utopian thinkers before them, as early as Plato. Marx and Engels condemned these abstract and theoretical utopias for not being grounded in reality, for not taking into account the material conditions of the time, and for therefore being unrealistic and futile, a common criticism of utopianism. By contrast, both Marx and the mother focused on creating the catalytic conditions for the societies they envisioned to be able to develop. While Marx himself would have shuddered to think of the communist project being referred to as utopian due to its contemporary conceptualization, the same reason Orwellians cringe at our community being referred to as a utopia, Marxist scholars have since theorized concrete and documented real utopias, prefigurative projects that exist within the limitations and potentialities of the present. The fact that the mother showed a keen interest in economic organization, both at the Sri Aurobindo Ashram and for Oroville, demonstrates the importance she lent to grounding these prefigurative experiments in spiritualized society in material conditions as real and concrete utopias. Economy is an area in which she gave not only broad directives for Oroville, the three founding texts of the community, the Oroville Charter, A Dream, and To Be a True Orovillian, all include elements of our economic ideals for the township, but also elements of specific arrangements. These would not only serve to concretize the project materially, but also to facilitate the spiritual evolution of consciousness that Sri Aurobindo and the mother perceived was already underway. This anticipatory quality of reaching for the not yet become while rooted in the present characteristic of Bloch's conception of concrete utopianism. It is to these economic ideals that we turn next. Economic Ideals for Oroville The broad strokes principles which can be gleaned from the mother's various statements on the topic are that Oroville's economy should be communal, with no private property and no exchange of money between community members, each of whom would contribute to the collective in one of three ways, work, kind, or money, and whose basic needs would, in turn, be provided for by the community. Just like the Sri Aurobindo Ashram, Orville would develop enterprises to finance the project. These guidelines had as their objectives not only to assure a socio-economic organization that would foster solidarity among community members, they would also support the spiritual evolution of individuals. The absence of private property in Orville would assist in compelling individuals to seek inspiration and reward for their work and action elsewhere than in worldly gains and satisfaction. In a dream, the mother describes, quote, a place where the needs of the spirit and the concern for progress would take precedence over the satisfaction of desires and passions, the search for pleasure and material enjoyment. Out of the three ways Orvillians would contribute economically to the community, work, kind or money, 
Work was the form which the mother described as necessary for their own inner discovery, for it would provide a field of action in which people could discover and develop their own potentialities. For Aurevillians to be able to choose work best suited for this personal growth, it had to be divorced from the necessity of earning a living, which is why she envisioned a community in which the basic needs of the members would be provided for collectively. In a dream, the mother describes a society in which, quote, work would not be a way to earn one's living, but a way to express oneself and to develop one's capacities and possibilities while being of service to the community as a whole, which, for its own part, would provide for each individual's subsistence and sphere of action. There are obvious parallels here with the argument for universal basic income, which proposes that all citizens of a nation receive an unconditional stipend, arguing that this would enable many individuals to engage in more meaningful work, something that would benefit humanity as a whole. Having a system of collective provisioning would not only ensure that the material conditions for the spiritualization of work would be assured, it would also create economic conditions in which cooperative human relationships could flourish. By supplanting transactions, be these monetized or accounted for through any alternative form of market-based exchange, between Aurevillians, free interactions, free in both senses of the term, could flourish in the community. The mother envisioned there being no money in Orville's internal economy, by which she almost undoubtedly meant no form of market-based exchange within the community. This would serve to enable individuals to thrive in society unrestricted by economic barriers and by the pernicious effects on human relationships that result from often unequal exchanges conditioned by the market. This rationale echoes that of Marx, for whom a key concern was the alienation and competition that arises between people in capitalist societies, in which individuals are not organized as a community, their work not contributing to the community as a whole, nor benefiting them as a member of the community, but instead favoring a bourgeois class, and, quote, conflicts with the ideal of solidarity with other human beings. In a dream, the mother imagines, quote, beauty in all its artistic forms, painting, sculpture, music, literature, would be equally accessible to all. The ability to share in the joy it brings would be limited only by the capacities of each one and not by social or financial position. In short, it would be a place where human relationships, which are normally based almost exclusively on competition and strife, would be replaced by relationships of emulation in doing well, of collaboration and real brotherhood. Sri Aurobindo previously wrote, quote, The aim of its economics would be not to create a huge engine of production whether of the competitive or the cooperative kind, but to give men, not only to some, but to all men in his highest possible measure, the joy of work according to their own nature and free leisure to grow inwardly, as well as simply a rich and beautiful life for all. The mother was clearly aware of the communist project and recognized the parallels between it and the principles of ideal socio-economic organization she began to apply in the Sri Aurobindo Ashram and further envisioned for Orville, which she said constituted, quote, a sort of adaptation of the communist system. She specified that it would be an adaptation because it would eschew what she called the spirit of leveling, a one-size-fits-all system which left no room for diversity in the relationship between the individual and the collective. She was very clear that each person residing in Orville 
would participate in the collective, but they would do so according to their capacities. Their participation was not something to be calculated, and the basic needs of each were to be met, but not, quote, according to ideas of rights or equality. This is in fact what Marx had foreseen as the future of communism, captured in their iconic idiom, quote, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Despite the intention explicit in the statement that the individual's capacity to participate in degree of need would be the decisive linchpin around which the collective would be organized, early communist states, such as the Soviet Union, established command economies in which what the mother refers to as leveling was the norm. Orville too has been challenged by the project of institutionalizing flexible systems, of organizing individuals into a collective without standardizing participation and exchange, and the remainder of this section will explore this in detail. Collective Provisioning Early Years and Rupture In the early years of the community, when Oroville was still operating under the aegis of the Sri Aurobindo Society, Orvillians each received the, the prosperity bundle from the Sri Aurobindo Ashram. This constituted a basic modicum of support that was the same for everyone, but individuals could make requests for additional items and families, of course, were awarded additional amounts according to the number of their children. The first collective provisioning operation of the Orville community was established in 1974 on the suggestion of a community member, Claire Fanning, who wrote to the mother in 1972 concerned with the existing circulation of money in Orville and expressing the need for a, quote, proper channel. Quote, if Orville is to function fluently for need and demand without the internal exchange of monies, perhaps it is time to create a proper channel. The mother approved of the idea, offered the name For All, Pour Tous, and the Sri Aurobind Society funded the service. Orville's managing Pour Tous supplemented food grown and products made by the community with purchased goods from ashram departments and the Pondicherry market. These food and sundry items were distributed to all Orvillians via a weekly basket delivery service along the same lines of prosperity, equal shares with exceptions made where needed. There was no exchange of money as Orvillians did not directly receive the funds allocated for their needs, which were instead collectively channeled into the For All Portus Fund. As I understand it, a confluence of events resulted in a significant shift away from the community's heretofore simplistic collective provisioning system in the 1980s, towards one in which individuals were allocated funds and credit against the fulfillment of certain conditions. Following the passing of the mother in 1973, the Sri Aurobindo Society attempted to institutionalize her charismatic authority and guidance of the community into ongoing management, which Aurovillians protested. The Sri Aurobindo Society went so far as to illegally withhold donations to Oroville, resulting in legal action and the involvement of the central government in the management of Oroville in 1980, as decreed in an Act of Parliament the Orville Emergency Provisions Act of 1980. The withholding of funds had thrown the community into a state of economic precarity. Its fledgling internal economy was not yet strong enough to sustain all of its members. The content of the community baskets had been meager even with the financial support of the Sri Aurobindo Society. I heard numerous accounts of Orvillians present at the time saying that on some occasions they would look at its contents and wonder how they would make it through the week, feeling thrilled when butter was included. In 1983, in the face of insufficient funds to provide for all Orvillians, the community chose to allocate resources only to those who were working for Orville. 
This was the founding of the maintenance system that is still in place today, in which Aurevillians receive a monthly stipend to an account in their name. The decision closely coincided with the granting of government funding to be dispersed to Aurevillians involved in education. A member of the Sri Aurobindo Ashram, Kiri Joshi, a previous officer of the Indian government's premier civil service, the Indian Administrative Service, was appointed education advisor to the government of India by then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in 1976, a post which he held till 1988. In 1983-1984, Mr. Joshi secured funding from the Indian government for Orville as an experimental site of integral education, the philosophy of education arising from integral yoga founding the Sri Aurobindo International Institute of Educational Research, SAYER, in Oroville, an entity that continues to receive and disperse the ongoing government grant, along with other donations towards educational research in the community. In 1984, the grant was awarded to educators, which required them having individual accounts in their names for accountability purposes. To avail of this financing, Orville needed a more complex and individuated structure than that of a common pot, which it had used to date. The notion of individual accounts was antithetical to the communal ethos and economic ideals of Orville. The shift from the collective to the individual as the primary locus of economic identity was perceived as a crisis of a divergence away from the founding aspiration of a collective life. The transition from centralized provisioning through Portus to the individualized maintenance system was a challenging one, as it effectively institutionalized a standardized exchange between each community member and the collective through, at least in part, the allocation of money, which for many was, and still is, a contradiction with the founding principles of Orville's communal economy. I have heard on several occasions people say, in tones bemoaning and berating, it is, quote, not an Orvillian system. The change prompted and was accompanied by a period of community-wide seminars, surveys, and general meetings centered on a widespread concern with the economic orientation and organization of Orville and the aspiration to set up a system that would reflect a continued commitment and development towards the original economic ideals. In the late 1980s, Portus became computerized, and each individual member or family unit was given an account in which to deposit funds, and encouraged to deposit these in advance of their Portus consumption. The community basket service soon phased out, with each individual or family paying individually for each item taken. But it was not to be the end of common pots. A series of others would emerge almost immediately after the maintenance system was established, which is explored in detail in Chapter 8. The Emergence of Orville's Current Economic System To mitigate the circulation of money in Oroville in the wake of the shift away from a simple common pot collective provisioning system to one in which individual community members were directly allocated resources, the community set up a new collective fund in 1991, the Oroville Maintenance Fund, administered by a financial service operative to this day. Each individual community member or family had their own account at the financial service, called a Portus account at first, retaining the name of the original communal fund and provisioning service, into which they could deposit personal funds and through which their Orville maintenance was channeled. All Orville entities, community members and units had accounts at the financial service, enabling cash-free transfers within the community, which continues to be the norm today. A communal fund and its mandate were established in June 1989 
alongside the Orville Maintenance Fund administered by the Financial Service. This central fund, now City Services Budget, collected earnings from Orville units, donations to the community, and a standard monthly contribution from each Orvillian adult to fund Orville's public sector, referred to in Orville as the service sector. There exist several categories of services. Prosperity services provide for the basic needs of community members, based on the mother's guiding directives that the basic needs of each would be born and provided for by the collective. Others, such as municipal, administrative, education and culture services, are dedicated to non-commercial community development. Communal funds either fully finance or subsidize the operating costs and provisions made by these services, as well as funding the maintenances of Orvillians working in them. By contrast, commercial units directly fund their own operating costs, including the maintenances of Orvillians working in the same, since they are income generating. The Economy Group, now Budget Coordination Committee, a representative group of revolving Orvillians from various community sectors, was established to manage the budgeting and allocation of the communal fund. Previously, funds were distributed to various sectors and geographical areas of Orville as decided upon at envelope community meetings, at which monies were dispersed in envelopes, as there was not yet a financial service with accounts for various Orville activities. The exploration from which the system of economic organization initially emerged had several iterations. In 1996, just a few years after it was established, a survey of 1,200 community members specifically asked which services should be part of this centrally supported economy, as well as the conditions for receiving a maintenance. To this day, Reforming the collective economic organization of the community so as to more closely reflect its founding economic ideals continues to be a topic of strong interest in the community, with many informal groups of individuals as well as economic working groups exploring how to do so. It is important to note that this topic and challenge was alive prior to the shift of the 1990s as well. One financial services executive highlights a general meeting in the early 80s in which the community had come up with three steps to phase towards a collective economy. We didn't manage to take the first, he exclaimed. There are no shortcuts, he offered as an explanation. We have to move ourselves. By which he was implying that we have to evolve as individuals in order for a collective shift to happen. I'm quite busy with that, and I see how hard it is, he adds, with a disarming depth of sincerity. Departures from Orville's founding communal economic principles. There have been several significant modifications of the economic system described above, still in place today, which many feel represent a further departure from the founding economic vision and ideals of the community. In 1998, a 33% contribution policy was introduced, whereby all commercial units, the term used to describe Orville's commercial enterprises, are expected to donate 33% of their net profit to city services unspecified. Previously, no percentage was defined, and donors were able to specify areas to be funded by their contributions. In 2017, this 33% contribution policy was extended to any income-generating service. In the mid-2000s, an economy group, faced with budgetary constraints, began requesting certain services to become, quote, self-supporting. Although they did not operate with the intention of generating a profit, they had to generate enough income to meet their operational costs. In practice, this has resulted in certain services requiring a fixed or scaling contribution from Orvillians to avail of their services provided. 
both the 33% contribution policy and the encouraging of self-supporting services have had significant ramifications for Oroville's collective economy and economic solidarity, particularly due to the economic policing they instigate. The following two sections will explore in detail the issues raised by and in the implementation of each, highlighting how the BCC, in charge of their economic administration, sought to navigate the bureaucratization and contradictions each entailed. In order to do the latter, I make use of extensive quotations of deliberations held during BCC meetings. The 33% contribution policy, or the policing of economic solidarity. The 33% policy was first established in 1998 to ensure that a reasonable amount was put towards the communal fund by all commercial units, while leaving enough profits, 67%, for the units to be able to reinvest in their own development should they choose to something which units intent on growing consider to be critical for the long-term prosperity of the community or contribute to specific projects. However, while the 33% was introduced as a minimum central fund contribution, in practice, very few units currently give more, including ones that are widely perceived as being financially able to. The unintended consequence of the policy establishing a practiced maximum rather than a minimum has been decried by several individuals involved in Orville's economic administration, notably at a recent general meeting on the new code of conduct for Orville units. One BCC member and commercial unit executive felt that the policy was flawed from the start because it conflicted with the mother's founding directive that commercial units would contribute all of their surplus profit to the community's central fund. The fact that it would erode this understanding was thus a predictable outcome. It was not in the scope of my research to explore or verify quantitatively whether, on average, Orville's commercial units did in fact contribute more to the communal fund before the introduction of the 33% policy. However, qualitative research yielded rich insights into a negative shift in attitudes that accompanied the adoption of this contribution policy on the part of both unit holders and BCC members themselves, who referred to the contribution as a tax and linked the policy to the erosion of goodwill and solidarity. Prior to the introduction of the policy, commercial unit executives decided independently how much they donated to the communal fund and were able to make specified contributions to designated sectors or activities. The 33% is an unspecified contribution, and while units are free to make additional specified donations, the practice has by and large disappeared. The only institutionalized carryover is an in-kind food items contribution units can make towards educational activities deductible from their 33%. That in-kind contributions are restricted to one sector seems contradictory to the ideal of no exchange of money, promoting on the contrary a financialization of Orville's internal economy. While commercial unit executives do not contest the role of the BCC as a dedicated community funding allocation body, some reported that they had found it more compelling to form relationships with other Orville projects by funding their activities directly through specified contributions. People used to be able to come to us and say, listen, I have a project, can you help me? We cannot even listen to people with projects anymore one commercial unit executive said to me, mournfully. Some resent the impersonality with which contributions are now arbitrarily expected of them and administered by a mechanism they feel disenfranchised from. They have such a way of processing the money that you give, it's just mind-blowing. 
because you've given this much more, then next year you have to give based on that. And it's just, it spirals off and you sit there and say, why am I even doing this? The erasure of mutuality and reciprocity predicated by the bureaucratic deployment of the 33% contribution policy has been corrosive to the fostering and maintaining of a sense of community, eroding what one commercial unit executive said used to be the joy of contribution, as well as undermining a feeling of fellowship between unit executives and the BCC. This is not surprising given that the BCC carries out a policing role, requesting the balance sheets of units to calculate the amounts due to the city services, following up with people who have not contributed the full 33%. However, BCC members are all too aware of the issues raised by the policy and its implementation, themselves bemoaning the fact that it compels them to act like tax collectors. The following conversation, sparked by the topic of pending contributions, offers remarkable insight into how they reflect on and resist bureaucratization to safeguard an Orville spirit. Field Notes from BCC Meeting, August 24th, 2017 What is the total pending contributions? asks Marvin, one of the members. We look at the spreadsheet projected on the screen in the meeting room. 3.6 crores, someone reads out loud. That's the total arrears since 2010. For 2016-2017, the past financial year, it's 1.5 crores pending. Several people utter shocked sounds. I'm also quite taken aback. And at the same time, I note that there is no penalty on late contribution. We are becoming tax collectors, says Ralph, visibly dismayed. I used to be on the economy group, People used to give. They should be generous and give. There's a different dynamic at present. It's not good. We don't want to go after units. Something is happening to this community regarding contributing. I'm just noting that. It's not good. We will become tax collectors. I have a strong feeling something is wrong. Getting to know Ralph in the context of BCC meetings had been a gem of a discovery for me. His intelligent and heartfelt dedication to the community and its ideals, anchoring what felt to me like a deep Orvillian spirit of the group. Often they don't give the minimum contributions, says Narayan, in his characteristically quiet and kind yet clear tone. His presence radiated these qualities which, alongside his competence and humility, reassured me that Orville's future was in good hands. A young Orvillian of about my age who had worked in banking in France, he had recently returned to the community with his young family and was working as a resource person for the BCC. The more we become tax collectors, the more people will try to avoid, says Marvin. Without choosing to do it, we are doing it, he adds in a stronger tone. It's easier for us to have an Excel sheet to calculate the 33% and to ask people to pay. Another option is to meet people and involve them in the decision-making. It's more time-consuming, and we cannot do it with a weekly BCC meeting. After a pause, we cannot decide alone. We have to associate everybody. We have to take a step, says Clements, acquiescing. And I felt relieved that it had all become so human. The vibe felt good, deeper, realer. We have to remind the community and unit holders that we are not tax collectors. Units are there to support all of us, says Arundhati, the Orville Board of Services representative. Sometimes units don't know that they have pending contributions, then get a big amount for years worth of arrears, says Praveen, the Orville Board of Commerce representative. This group is lacking competency in sending them clear requests. A few of us, myself included, nodded. It sounded very plausible. When Solana was here, she said a lot of the younger people simply didn't understand clearly, Isabella adds. So we have to make a statement, give some information, asks Clemens, trying to concretize next steps, with just an undertone of frustration which betrayed the many years she must have spent having these kinds of conversations, only to not see them followed up on. Shall we post something in the news and notes? asks Arundhati. As soon as we do that, an us and them is created with the unit holders, and we don't want to do that. It should be a last resort. 
says Isabella, the BCC secretary. It requires personal relationship, emphasizes Ralph, the financial service representative. We just have to do it. Phone calls to those units. I get all kinds of reactions when I contact unit executives, says Narayan, referring to when he first informs them via email of their pending contributions. People who are happy to pay, people who acknowledge the arrears but don't settle them, people who don't reply. It would help if someone could do a phone follow-up. Sometimes they tell you a whole story. It's not easy, he says uneasily. I'm not a fiscal agent. I'm not going to say if you don't pay, it'll be an extra 10%. I don't want to do that. I didn't come here to Oroville for that. The BCC members certainly did not feel like tax collectors to me. This exchange conveys that, despite the institutionalization of economic policies in Oroville, there is another spirit that underlies and informs how the BCC functions, one that ensures that the human and humane remain central to it as an Oroville institution. Policies were not indiscriminately considered to be the key referent in addressing a given situation objectively. On the contrary, the subjective and personal aspects of these were routinely discussed and assessed. I theorize this administrative practice as subjective objectivity. It is precisely the subjectivity and the subjectivity that ensures that it remains Orvillian in character, fundamentally flexible, responsive and solidary, relevant in the context of increased bureaucratization in Oroville. These findings may be surprising for some community members, however, who reported that they felt the BCC lacked empathy and understanding in their administrative practice. One commercial unit executive said she wished there were more heart behind it, while I found that BCC members internally discussed issues pertaining to fellow community members with a surprising degree of compassion. I offer two points of consideration to account for this discrepancy. The first is that the BCC's communication practices do not accurately reflect and embody its administrative practice. The second is that the very existence of a policy and its deployment, the look and feel of an objective tax alone, in and of itself has a detrimental effect on goodwill, and perhaps even on economic solidarity within the community. Both have broader implications for developing forms and practices of institutionalization and administration practice in Oroville and other anarchist contexts that retain a culture of mutuality. On self-supporting services or the permeation of capitalist logic. In the mother's early conceptions of economic provisioning in Oroville, she imagined community-funded services that would meet the basic needs of Orovillians without charging them individually for these, for this would be key to realizing a society with no exchange of money. In the early years of community life, the Portu service operated this way, and as the community's size and economy grew, so did its service sector, with services fully or partially funded by the central fund, or as it came to be called, the city services budget based on how much the fund could support, how essential the service was, and how many Orvillians made use of it. In the mid-2000s, the economy group in charge of this budgeting exercise assessed the model of centrally supported services as financially onerous and inefficient, and encouraged a shift towards self-supporting services to address this. Self-supporting services were to operate in the same spirit as centrally funded services, and that they were to meet basic needs of Orvillians on a cost price, not for profit basis, but with no support from the city services budget. They would have to push operational costs to users, something that partially funded services also must resort to in order to stay afloat. Doing so is problematic because by asking these services to be income generating, it forces them to operate on a different economic logic one in which community members become consumers, causing services to lose their institutional character. Even though they may only be charging cost price, having Orvillians individually pay for services rendered goes against the economic ideals of collective and free provisioning, and many community members and service administrators resent this divergence. 
The practice of charging alone can even arouse suspicion as to whether the service is operating at a profit instead of in a true, quote, spirit of service, to the point that their receiving financial support from the city services budget is contested. The current BCC is well aware of this double standard. Services are meant to provide services free of cost to Orvillians, yet they are compelled to charge Orvillians for services rendered because they are not fully funded, and the erosional dynamic it engenders for such services. Field Notes from BCC Meeting, August 31st, 2017. When we start giving a double standard, you have to be a service but you can bill a little, it starts to go wrong, says Arundhati, the ABS representative and an executive of a fully funded service. How do you know what part to bill? If I had to bill, it would be a headache. Where do I stop? How much do I take? Shankara service was amazing. It is going wrong because we are asking it to bill. We really have to support the services, but support them completely so that they don't have to go into billing things. I really think it's important to take care of all of us. And that is the way we're doing that, with services. So I find it really hard that we ask services to be self-supporting and then question them. We have a lot of services like this, Praveen adds in a defeated tone. BCC, we are for the services. It is our strength. So each time I see a service die, Arundhati adds, her voice vibrant with exasperation. I so agree with what Arundhati says, Isabella pipes in. Once you start charging, it's the end of the service somehow. We have to do something about pure services for Orvillians, says Ralph, with earnest passion and concern. This is the most crucial stuff. We've got to get back there. This dual thing, partially supported services, was a good intention, but... Part of our mandate, one of the first things, is to promote an economy without exchange of money, asserts Marvin. But we let things go naturally, and the market takes up allocation of resources because we're not... I don't understand. It's as if we don't care. This table proposed to run a budget-based portus to the FAMC. And they shot it down, Ralph continues. They didn't even understand. This is where Orville is, 50 years. It's a failure for me, he says, with a disappointment that pierces my spirit, or rather, the Orvillian spirit in me. To commercialize services, that would be the easy path, he adds, and it'll be efficient, but that's not the Orville I want. In the latter exchange, BCC members are critically assessing and mourning the erosion of pure services, ones fully funded by the central city services budget to provide for Orvillians without charging them money, and key to the establishing of Orville as the economic real utopia envisaged by the mother. However, they find themselves unable to reverse this trend. The Portus proposal, for instance, being rejected by their overseeing body, the FAMC, which is continuing to introduce policies that move away from a pure services model for the sector. According to the new 2017 Code of Conduct for Unit Executives, drafted by the FAMC and Working Committee, any service funding more than 50% of its own running costs should contribute 33% of their profits to the communal fund, just like Orville's commercial units do. In administering services and commercial units in the same way, this further erodes the identity of the former as belonging to a space of provisioning outside of the market, even normalizing services operating at a profit, something which is antithetical to their originally conceived role and reflective of the current trend of neoliberalization. The introduction of the policy is a direct consequence of the administratively untenable double standard raised in the above excerpted conversation, in which services are required to charge, yet expected not to operate at a profit. It represents what a BCC member described as the easy path, which unfortunately institutionalizes a further departure from Orville's communal economic ideals and highlights the difficulty of establishing prefigurative utopias within the constraints of the present and influence of mainstream trends, in this case, of a capitalist logic. Maintenances. 
the individualized component of collective provisioning. Maintenances, individually allocated provisions, complement centrally funded services and providing for the basic needs of Orvillians. And this section will explore how their design and implementation negotiates and reflects the challenges of institutionalizing Orville's economic ideals. As previously highlighted, the maintenance system was criticized at the time of its emergence for being a standardized, individualized exchange between each community member and the collective, through at least in part the allocation of money, which for many was and still is a contradiction with the founding principles of Oroville's communal economy. These attitudes still exist today, with in addition the complaint that the cash portion of maintenances are too low, recently exacerbated by the rising cost of living in India and the cost of increasing numbers of services being pushed to users. That said, their design does reflect Oroville's core economic ideals, a collective economy in which the basic needs of community members are centrally provided for with no exchange of money, even though it does not fully meet them. I refer in this section to the full-time city services maintenance, as it is the standard centrally designed, administered and dispersed maintenance. There exist other categories such as part-time maintenance, children's maintenance, student maintenance and apprentice maintenance. Notably, maintenances awarded to Orvillians working in the community's commercial sector are not centrally budgeted for and administered by the BCC because commercial units are income generating and thus in capacity to remunerate them directly. Maintenances in the ideal of no exchange of money. To mitigate the exchange of money, city services maintenances are split in each account into designated INR currency amounts, into both in-kind and cash portions. While the cash credit can be withdrawn as Indian rupees and freely used by Orvillians inside or outside Orville, the kind portion cannot. It can only be transferred to and from other Orville financial service accounts, so that it effectively acts like a local currency, a measure adopted worldwide to strengthen the economies of local communities. To maintain the element of collective provisioning, a portion of the standard city services maintenance is automatically allocated each month to a variety of services and collective funds in Oroville that provide for the basic needs of Orvillians, notably health and food. This is allocated in the name of the individual or family who can then avail of the in-kind credit at the services. Orvillians have some freedom in these allocations for example, they can choose the eatery to which their lunch credit is transferred and can also choose to allocate more of their in-kind credit in this way to optional services such as Nandini, a clothing, linens and tailoring outfit. On the basis of need, the allocation of city services maintenances. Maintenances are allocated according to work undertaken if the individual needs it informed by the founding economic ideal of economic support from the community at large being awarded to individuals on the basis of need and against their participation in the project. Financial need is determined by the Human Resources Team, a group that disperses the maintenances allocated to specific services by the BCC. If someone newly joins a service, she must go to HRT if she would like to be awarded a city services maintenance. The HRT will then verify whether the BCC budget for that particular service includes any additional city services maintenances that have not yet been allocated. If so, one will be awarded to the individual only if she does not have any other source of income or savings that are considered substantial enough for the individual not to require maintenance, based on his or her life circumstances. This process is based on goodwill. The HRT does not formally investigate whether Orvillians have, have extra Orville assets, bank accounts or incomes. While some feel this information should be accessible to HRT, many Orvillians are against this, in keeping with a culture of respecting the individual sphere within the collective, enacting Sri Aurobindo's principle of spiritualized community, unity and diversity, a foundational ideal for Orville. 
standardized city service maintenances, balancing individual and collective provisioning. City service maintenances are a standard amount with fixed allocations of the cash and kind portions. Aside from the concerns with maintenances being an individuated form of provision, there is also concern regarding their standardization. This is an issue because it goes against the economic ideals of Oroville in which people participate how they feel called to and receive what they need. There is also criticism and resentment towards standardized maintenances because these are based on a predetermination of people's basic needs by Orville's economic working groups, which some Orvillians feel is misjudged. To my knowledge, no in-depth evaluation has been undertaken on what Orvillians feel their needs are, certainly not recently, although this is something the FAMC did intend to undertake. Although many Orvillians complain that the city services maintenance is too low, it has never been raised significantly, only in accordance with rising costs of living. Last year, for instance, the BCC raised the maintenance level for the first time in several years to match the rising cost of living due to the introduction of a new Comprehensive Goods and Services Tax, or GST, by India's central government. Increasing maintenances is not a default measure because of the ongoing concern that these constitute an individuated system of provisioning that contradicts Orville's communal economic ideals. When I was sitting in on meetings last year in which raising maintenances due to GST was discussed, several members insisted that the kind portion of the maintenance would have to be increased if the cash portion were to be. If not, we would be moving towards an even more individuated and cash-based economy. If the group was considering raising maintenances, some felt they should first consider whether existing services could be further subsidized instead, or new services created, to better provide for Oravillians, given that such measures would reduce the exchange of money in Oroville, one of the community's core economic aims. To come back to a point made in the previous section, the introduction of self-supporting services has, however, significantly compromised this approach. The BCC and other Oravillians are well aware that the standardized maintenance policy is not responsive to the diversity of individual needs, and that upholding a communal definition of individuals' basic needs is a fallacy for the Orville project. However, how to administer maintenances in a subjectively objective manner is hard to envisage institutionalizing at a community scale. In a BCC discussion centered on this, one member said, quote, I agree that a person can have more than me if he needs it. I don't need 10,000 rupees, but I know people who need more than 10,000 rupees. I like the idea of having more flexibility to allocate according to needs, but it's very subjective. To implement it is very difficult. The next chapter will explore smaller scale collective accounts experiments that sought to uphold such flexibility and an attempt to institutionalize their organizing principles and administrative practices in an Orville service. Conclusion Subjective Objectivity or the Bureaucratization of Anarchy Quote, So, a subjective objectivity would be the opposite, perhaps an objective view that would not be imprisoned by the process of objectivism, objectification, and quantification, but will remain attentive to subjective perceptions. Orville's historical trajectory clearly shows that Orvillians have intentionally and strategically developed their communal economic framework to prefigure an Orville economy. Although we have and continue to face financial, legal and administrative challenges in doing so, as well as competing approaches to addressing these. We remain self-critical of our trajectories and outcomes, demonstrating a critical utopianism in an additional sense of the term, coined by Moylan to convey critical, both in the sense of critical mass and critique. 
in effectively establishing an alternative economic organization based on our economic ideals nonetheless, including by repurposing elements that disrupted these, such as maintenances introduced to channel Indian government funding, I argue that we have successfully engaged in the exercise of establishing a real utopia or concrete utopia, both terms that Marxist scholars use to describe existing projects, grounded in the material conditions of the present while seeking to transform these. However, our economic organization has also failed to secure core prefigurative aspects of this economic utopia, such as fully funded services to provide for Aurovillians collectively outside of the realm of the market in the face of financial and administrative challenges. The latter are closely linked with the increasing institutionalization of Oroville's communal administration, which is currently in a predictable phase of bureaucratization. Yet, I observe that despite the artifacts of this bureaucratization, such as policies, the process of economic administration of the communal fund specifically is retaining flexibility and responsiveness. This is what led me to theorize its nature as subjectively objective, a concept that I further element with the reflexivity demonstrated by the fund's administrators. One of these offered the following reflection in response to reading this chapter. Quote, yes, that's a real question. How is it that most of those who apply the current policies do so while regretting that this is so? Could they have led themselves into a trap? That is to say, instead of inventing new forms of management of the collective, they relied on proven methods, rationally bureaucratic, quantitatively objectifying, which have their own consequences? The question is open. What these consequences are or might be is an important question for the community. As we have seen, one is the corrosion of a felt sense of community. Even though the policies that abound in Oroville in its current phase of bureaucratization intend to capture community-level agreements based on clarity and fairness. This raises the bigger question of whether the character of this institutionalization will stifle the spiritually prefigurative nature of Orville's utopian project, which draws on subjectivity in Sri Aurobindo's use of the term, highlighted to me by a fellow Aurovillian. Quote, Sri Aurobindo defines a society as subjective when its individuals have found their psychic being and want to live under its influence. He speaks of the principles of organization of the communal life of a subjectivized society, imagine systems that surpass objectivity, that draw on another dimension. The next chapter will focus on how Orvillians have engaged in prefigurative, collective economic experiments outside the sphere of economic administration that are intentionally predicated on subjectivity and flexibility, and on how these have contested informed and engaged with it in shaping the community's institutional economic development in accordance with Orville's economic ideals.